It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Buddy Shaw. He is the CEO and co-founder of ID Insight, a client service nonprofit that uses data and evidence to help leaders combat poverty globally. ID Insight carefully tailors a wide range of quantitative tools, such as randomized trials and machine learning, to enable their clients to design better policies, rigorously evaluate those ideas, and take, in, take informed action at scale to improve lives. ID Insight makes rigorous impact evaluation and other quantitative tools more demand-driven and responsive to the budgetary, operational, and time constraints faced by policymakers and practitioners working in international development. Dr. Shaw has worked previously at the World Bank's Governance and Public Sector Reform Unit and at MIT's Jamil Poverty Action Lab. He holds an AB in Economics from Harvard University, an MD with special distinction in Global Health Policy from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and an MPA International Development from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He is a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations and has represented ID Insight as an echoing Green Fellow, a Reiner Arnhold Fellow, and one of Forbes Magazine's top 30 under 30 social entrepreneurs around the world. Today, he'll be speaking about what the animal welfare movement can learn from medicine and global development. Please join me with a warm welcome for Dr. Neil Buddy Shaw. Thank you. All right, well, it's, it's great to be here. Um, and thanks for that introduction. One of the things that you may have noticed from the introduction is that there's not a single mention of animal welfare in anything that I've done. And so I just want to start out by making one big caveat, which is that, as you heard, I'm a doctor and development economist by training. I work full-time in global development, and I am not categorically an animal welfare expert. However, I do think that there's a tremendous amount that the animal welfare movement can learn from the advancements both in medicine as well as social policy domestically and in international development. And so what I'm hoping to do in this talk is first opine on a set of hypotheses that I have about what those learnings might be and the implications for the animal welfare movement. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, to get ideas and really critical feedback from those of you who do work on the animal welfare movement about which of the, these ideas actually have some potential legs and should be explored further and which of them are really the result of my own naivete. So I think we all start from a very similar proposition, which is that we're really concerned with how we can most effectively improve the welfare of billions of animals. And there are a huge number of potential interventions that we have at our disposal in order to actually affect that change. Everything from voluntary corporate campaigns, regulatory and policy reforms, to individual behavior change interventions. And my proposition is that just as in medicine and global development, data and evidence have an absolutely crucial role for effective altruists and others to de determine how to do the most good possible. And I think that there are some very tactical things that we can take from those other fields as we try to mature the field of animal welfare across the world. So first, I think it's pretty obvious to most people that animal welfare shares a huge number of common challenges with both medicine, public health, and development economics. We're equally concerned with questions around how do we most effectively improve lives, whether those are human lives or non-human animals, which interventions are most cost effective, how do we actually know whether something works or is cost effective, and then how do we design interventions and measure their effectiveness, both when it comes to individual behavior change interventions, as well as how to create policy change and broader systemic reforms. And a lot of other people have recognized these similarities, and in fact, there's been a blossoming of a number of really excellent animal welfare research organizations, from anim animal charity evaluators, the Sentience Institute, Faunalytics, Humane League Labs, and of course, the Open Philanthropy Project. But despite all of this progress in recent years, one of the things that I want to argue, and I'm happy to get pushback on this, is that the animal welfare research infrastructure and ecosystem is incredibly immature compared to what has developed over decades, both in social policy and in medicine and public health. And this really complex diagram that isn't that helpful 
is used as a showcase for just how sophisticated the medical space is when it comes to the production of evidence, the synthesis of entire bodies of evidence, translating that synthesis into and disseminating that for practitioners, and then enforcing the use of that evidence by everyday doctors who are not necessarily well-versed either in how to produce or use that evidence. And at each node in this ecosystem around the production and use of evidence, you have a really robust ecosystem of organizations that are specialized in ensuring incredibly high quality at each of those nodes. And as you see in the middle, there's a shared set of values and norms around what constitutes good evidence and what doesn't constitute good evidence. And what I want to argue is that there's an analog for all of that from medicine and global development to animal welfare. And some of the core components of that are that one, there are long-term coherent and coordinated research agendas in medicine and global development such that the sum of any individual papers or research objectives in medicine and global development add up to a lot more than what they would otherwise. And one of the risks I think that we run within the animal welfare movement is that you have a bunch of separate actors running individual trials and that those aren't aggregating into a larger picture beyond what those individual papers actually reveal. The second is that there are clear evidentiary standards. So people across the sector, across institutions, have an ability to refer to a common vocabulary in order to argue and debate about what works and what doesn't and what the quality of evidence is. And I think that that is still more immature in the animal welfare movement than it is in these other fields. The third is that there are protective measures to prevent data mining and other publication biases through pre-registration and pre-analysis plans in these other fields, which could be worth adopting in the animal welfare space. And the final leg is that even if you have exceptional evidence creation, you need to have mechanisms to ensure that funding flows based on that evidence. And me both medicine and global development have created results-based financing mechanisms to ensure that that happens. And while that hasn't spread across those fields, there are important lessons from that. So, Based on this review, I want to propose two initial ideas for the animal welfare movement. And again, very curious to get pushback from those of you who work full time in this space. The first is that we need essentially the equivalent of the National Institutes of Health for animal welfare. And the second is that we need to start actively exploring results-based financing for animal welfare nonprofits. So I'll take each one in turn. The first idea around an overarching national body to organize research and funding for animal welfare has two sub-proposals. The first is that we need to start creating as an entire ecosystem, not individual organizations, a long-term coordinated research agenda that is based on what's called value of information approach in, in medicine and public health. And the second is to draft and adopt sector-wide evidence grading standards. Again, both of these are gonna be very difficult to implement because they require ecosystem-wide buy-in and collaboration between a number of different organizations. But if we're able to do that the same way that medicine has, I think that you'll see disproportionate returns and nonlinear returns to those efforts. So the first is, why do we actually need a coordinated research agenda? Aren't we already doing pretty well with all of these organizations, which I mentioned more uh, previously? And I think the short answer is that there is an incredibly complex theory of change to get to the end outcomes of fewer animals farmed and farmed animals suffering less. And there's a whole host of interventions that can get us to those ultimate goals, whether that's dietary change interventions, funding for meat alternatives, and then the whole individual behavior change process that has to happen once those technologies actually exist, to public advocacy through regulatory and legislative reform, voluntary corporate campaigns, and humane farming advocacy. And at every single one of these nodes in this complex theory of change, there are huge unanswered questions about which one is actually most cost effective. And despite the blossoming of funding in this space, Open Phil has given over $90 million to date for animal welfare, which is incredible, but that's still a finite amount of resources. And so which of these nodes we focus on should be informed by some hypothesis on where we're gonna get the most bang for our buck. 
And if you look at what exists to date, there's a lot of really high quality or nascent but high quality evidence generation in the animal welfare movement from animal charity evaluators, Sentience Institute, Open Phil, and a host of other organizations. But what's lacking is actually a systematic look at moving from left to right, an overarching theory of change that's tied to the literature and evidence, a standard and accepted review of how to evaluate the effectiveness of individual papers, then in the fourth column, how do you actually aggregate individual papers to have a holistic view of, say, the effect of leafleting on behavior change? Then what's missing across the board is what is the actual benefit from answering one question in that theory of change, and what is the cost? So is that $10 million to answer one of those nodes, or is it something cheaper? And finally, a prioritization of research questions that flows from that cost benefit or the value of information of actually getting more data on one of those particular nodes in the theory of change. And finally, the last column is, is there a user-friendly presentation for NGOs, funding organizations that can easily go to that without being a statistics expert and say, okay, these are the top five things that I should be funding based on the evidence as well as room for more funding. And I think what we see here, and this is no knock on the exceptional organizations that have done this work, is that no organization in the animal welfare movement has actually set out to create a long-term, cohesive, and coordinated research agenda. And that's what's gonna be required in order to really essentially achieve the long-term goals that the space has. So how do we actually get to that value of information uh, analysis in order to determine where we should be prioritizing our finite resources. So in medicine and global development, you essentially move from a theory of change to individual research topics, to calculating the cost benefit of answering individual research topics, and then you arrive at a prioritized research agenda. And this is a highly quantitative exercise, usually in medicine and global development, where you literally quantify the amount that a decision maker whether that's the Good Food Institute or Open Phil, would pay for a piece of evidence to make a decision. Unfortunately, in the animal welfare movement, we're at such an early stage in the generation of evidence that we can't quantify it. However, what we can do is use the same process in order to prioritize research topics, and as the literature gets more mature, we can actually start to quantify the returns we'd get to investing in different research topics. And there are five key components to the value of information approach. The first is what are your priors? So what evidence exists now about the impact of an intervention? Say the effect of leafleting on behavior change and reducing meat. Then the second question you have to ask is what is the variance on your prior? So do you have high confidence in your estimate or low confidence? The third component is how much do you expect to spend on this? Would leafleting consume a huge amount of resources for the movement Yes or no? And then how much would it cost to actually answer that question and update those priors that you have? And then finally, is there actually room for more funding? And based on these five components of the value of information approach, what we can arrive at is a research prioritization. So again, this isn't quantified the same way that it would be in medicine or health, but, and this is purely illustrative, so those of you who are you know, huge advocates for corporate campaigns or ballot initiatives, please don't skewer me, but the point is that you can go through each of these, and what it allows is that there's still gonna be differences of opinions among people in the community, but it makes explicit the assumptions behind why one of these initiatives should receive more research funding than the other, and allows for some prioritization. So that's the first part of the proposal, that we need to create a long-term research agenda, and I think if you look at the theory of change, a lot of people will say, hey, we're getting huge bang for our buck, from voluntary corporate campaigns, so let's double down on that. But the point is that over time, if we want to actually get to a dramatic reduction in the number of animals farmed, you need to start attacking other nodes in that theory of change. And to attack those nodes cost effectively five, 10 years down the line, you need to start generating the research today about what's gonna be most effective at those nodes. The second part of the first NIH for animal welfare proposal is that we need to institute evidence grading standards to avoid the mistakes of medicine and global development. So some of you may be familiar with the fact that 
there's been a huge what's called replication crisis in medicine, psychology, and other social sciences where people have argued that most published research findings are false and that there's an incredible waste of resources around poor medical research. And so we want to create and adopt the standards that have been used in medicine and global development to curb some of those ills in the animal welfare movement while the movement is still young. But we need to adapt it to the particularities of the animal welfare movement. So the first should be, as with medicine and global development, that these standards of evidence quality withstand academic scrutiny from other fields. The second key component is that they have to be practitioner focused so that someone leading an animal welfare NGO or a funding organization, again, doesn't need to be an econometrician to be able to see a grading of a particular intervention and say, this is a good use of my money. And the third is that this evidence rating system, as with medicine, needs to convey both the size of the impact of an intervention as well as the epistemological uncertainty with that. So how certain are you that that estimate is actually correct? And so what I think the animal welfare movement needs to adopt is essentially a version of evidence-based medicine, which has a really simple rubric for all clinicians in order to determine whether to provide aspirin to a heart attack patient, whether to get an x-ray for someone who has a presumed sprained ankle. And it's broken down into just two columns. What is the potential magnitude of effect rated as strong or weak? And what is the confidence in your estimate? High, low, or medium quality evidence. And all interventions are based on these two criteria. And there's a very simple rubric in order to look at the literature, in order to determine whether you get A, B, or C in terms of high, medium, or low quality evidence. And while a lot of this rubric from medicine wouldn't apply to the animal welfare movement, you can adapt something similar um, to the particularities of, of the movement. So instead of imprecision, indirectness, inconsistency, and publication bias, which might be less concerns, you might want to rate the animal welfare movement's literature on, is there a robust measure of decrease in consumption of meat? Because a lot of studies rely on self-reported consumption of meat, which is very unreliable, versus, say, grocery store data on actual um, purchases of meat. And so there are definitely significant alterations you need to make to this uh, criteria, but I think that Again, with a holistic kind of group and collaborative effort between different researchers in the animal welfare movement, you can arrive at something similar to what the NIH and the field of medicine has arrived at. Um, and again, what this, this does not give you crystal clarity on what to do. There's always going to be subjective judgment involved. But what it does allow for is that these are judgments that are made explicitly and with transparency around the actual underlying factors that led to that decision. And so there still might be debates on whether you should do leafleting versus online ads versus corporate campaigns, but having sector-wide evidence grading standards actually allows people to debate on specific and important um, underlying factors and reasons. The second proposal I want to make, based on what we can learn from medicine and global development, is that just generating high quality evidence about what works has been shown to simply not be enough within the field of global development. There are a ton of great studies showing cost-effective interventions, and organizations in the EA community like GiveWell, JPAL, ID Insight can all attest to the fact that there is not enough uptake and scaling of programs that have been proven to be effective. And part of the reason for that is that there are not sufficient incentives for organizations to deliver against results. And introducing results-based financing in the animal welfare movement has the potential both to incentivize creation of new solutions to intractable problems. So for instance, a lot of people in the movement have said, look, it's too hard to change individual behavior. We just need to wait until clean meat gets so good and so cheap that everyone's going to uh, transition by themselves, um, but the reality is that if you really incentivize it with financial returns and payment based on results, you might get more innovative solutions, and we've seen those analogs within global development. And then the second component is that it ensures that philanthropic dollars actually go towards programs that work. 
Um, and there are a lot of different ways that you can adapt results-based financing mechanisms to the animal welfare movement. Um, from some of our colleagues that work in the global development space at Instiglio, they've categorized them in three broad buckets. The first are performance-based contracts, which is a simple arrangement between an outcome pair, often a foundation or a government, and an implementing organization, where essentially the implementing organization gets paid based on the extent to which they achieve predetermined results as judged by an independent evaluator. There's a more complex mechanism that de-risks it for philanthropists where you can actually get private sector investors to put up essentially risk capital, saying that you know, if the program works, we'll get a positive return on our investment. If it fails, then we'll lose all that money. And that allows a foundation essentially to only pay for results. Um, and then the third are prizes. So there are things like the X Prize, the X Prize for space, X Prize for adult literacy, that basically have a huge pot of money and incentivize competition from people to solve a particular problem and then reward a large payout to the organization that ultimately succeeds. So again, these are early stage hypotheses, but my proposition is that there's a ton that the animal welfare movement can learn from more mature social justice causes like medicine, public health, and global development. And I think it makes sense for us to come together as a community so to start to evaluate which of those actually can be adapted and could potentially accelerate animal welfare improvements for billions of non-human animals. Thanks and looking forward to the questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, one question right off the bat for me is, I don't know exactly what it is in medicine, but since we're all humans, it seems like there's a more standard kind of unit of account that can kind of be put into place, whether it's quality adjusted life years or you know, something right. like that, right, that we're uh, buying with our dollars. First conceptual problem I see in trying to do something like this is all the different animals. Like, do they count the same? Do they count yeah. differently? And do you think that this problem is amenable to the framework that you're proposing? Yeah, I mean, great question. I think pretty fundamental one. Uh, it's not something that I talked about explicitly here, but what I do imagine kind of a quote unquote NIH for the animal welfare movement doing is some of the basic research along those lines. So there are large kind of unanswered or semi-answered questions around how do you value the life of different types of animals. Um, and there's a lot of basic science research that needs to be done around better understanding the ability for pain and pleasure of different types of animals. And I imagine that if you establish such an institute with clear evidence standards so that it lives up to kind of a certain threshold, then you can start to lay the foundation to say, okay, there's an, a kind of DALI's equivalent in the animal welfare space. And I know that there are some researchers that are trying to do something like that, but the big benefit of a program like this is that um, it actually kind of doesn't rely on individual researchers in their own subjective judgment, but enforces more across the board quality standards. Um, so I, I do think that something like that would be part of it. Interesting. Um, okay, well, first uh, question from the audience, can we get your slides? Yes. <laughs> uh, how would you like to arrange for that? Uh, I can just send it to Barry or EA Global Speaker. All right, sounds good. We'll get that through the, uh, the organizers. Cool. Um, so here's a question about a disanalogy. Animal advocacy researchers are studying how to influence economic behaviors of social creatures in communities. By contrast, medical researchers are studying biological effects of medical treatments in individuals. How relevant do you think that difference is? So I think that is a difference, but medical researchers are also studying the effects of interventions on populations in public health. And I think a lot of those are really analogous to the animal welfare movement. I mean, so much of public health and global development is around behavior change. How do you get people to test themselves for malaria or HIV AIDS? Once they've tested positive, how do you get them to actually adhere to the program um, and the treatment? In the same way, you wanna be able to test, you, you wanna be able to test the effectiveness of interventions of people to actually, who express a desire to reduce their meat consumption to then actually do that. And so I think that so much of this is about A, individual behavior change, and B, about policy or regulatory reform. And those two things are 
quite analogous to large parts of both the medical and the development economics literature, even if there are certain segments of the medical literature that are more physiologic in, orient in orientation. I'm getting a message here that since it is the last session of the day, we can't uh, go over as much as we have earlier. So I think we'll have to, unfortunately, wrap it there. Do you have office hours coming up tomorrow? Will you be back? Yes, I have office okay, hours. Okay, great. Do you know when they are? I do not. Okay, we'll get that to you. Um, uh, I, I'd also just encourage anyone that works in animal welfare full time to please contact me. We've been working with Lewis Bollard at Open Phil to see if any of these ideas actually have legs and should get more sailings in animal welfare movements. So really keen to get feedback from folks that are working on this kind of 24 seven. Awesome, well it's been a very thought provoking presentation. How about a round of applause for Neil, Buddy, Shaw. Thank you very much.